Do any of you remember the movie called Rat Race? It's a 2001 film about a bunch of random strangers who are gathered together to race from Las Vegas to New Mexico and the winner of the race will receive two million dollars. The contestants are an eclectic group ranging from a narcoleptic, non-mute Italian version of Mr. Bean to a failed NFL official who's trying to sink into anonymity. Fun fact, in the scene here where Cuba Gooding Jr.'s character blows the coin toss, this dude right here is my cousin's husband. Watching these characters resort to all kinds of ridiculous techniques in an effort to win makes for a pretty fun viewing experience. That's basically what is going on in the Western Conference right now. There are six or seven teams fumbling and bumbling their way along trying to claim the final two wildcard spots. The Dallas Stars have lost four in a row, scoring just three goals. They've also lost five of their last six overall. And this comes after their CEO called out the two best players on the team. The Colorado Avalanche have won just four of their last 18 games. Frustration has clearly been high as McKinnon and Bednar went at it on the bench last week during a game in Calgary. On November the 24th, the Minnesota Wild were 14-7-2 and in second place in the Western Conference. They are now 23-21-3 and, and tied for the final wildcard spot. The Anaheim Ducks set a franchise record with 12 consecutive losses before beating the aforementioned Wild 3-0 last night. A lot of people saw this coming as the Ducks have been terrible all season, but John Gibson has been bailing them out time and again. The Vancouver Canucks have lost five of their last seven, being shut out three times. They clearly miss Elias Pettersson a great deal. All these teams have been playing so poorly that the St. Louis Blues, who were tied for dead last in the league on November 29th, are right back in the race, even though they've barely played above 500, winning just 12 of 23 games since then. And then, of course, there are the Oilers, who are tied with the Wild and Ducks for the final playoff spot. What a bizarre season they've had. The latest development being that the organization has let it be known that they are all in to make the playoffs, willing to trade a goaltender, a young developing forward, and even their first round draft pick in order to upgrade their forward group. And you know, from what I've read on Twitter, Oilers fans are taking this news pretty well. <laughs> I disagree with this strategy. After the Brandon Manning trade, it's clear Shirelli has lost the plot and is just grasping at straws to try and remain employed. TSN 1260 put a poll on Twitter not too long ago that said, would you rather the Oilers miss the playoffs and fire the GM or make the playoffs and keep the GM? And it got me to thinking, why does it have to be one or the other? Making the playoffs and firing the general manager do not need to be mutually exclusive. I, for one, am sick and tired of having an extremist attitude when it comes to the Oilers. I've had way too many years of accepting and even hoping for losses to try and get a top pick or to get somebody fired. So, keeping in mind that I don't believe the Oilers will fire Shirelli in season. Here is how I hope the rest of the year transpires. First of all, I would prefer if the Oilers didn't make any roster moves for the rest of the season. There are many reasons for this. I don't trust Shirelli to get full value in a trade, much less outright win a transaction. Also, the Oilers don't have many assets to use as bargaining chips, and the ones they do have should not be sacrificed for a short-term solution. I hate to burst anyone's bubble, but the Oilers are not going to win the Stanley Cup this year. And that's okay. There are 30 teams that are not going to win the Stanley Cup this year. Edmonton simply does not have the forward depth to go on an extended playoff run. So they're far better off keeping their prospects and their draft picks until they are in a position to challenge for a championship. 
And the last reason I want them to stand pat, and this may seem kind of petty, but I feel very vindictive towards Cates, Nicholson, and Shirelli. The way I feel is that this is the bed you guys have made. Now you need to lie in it. The roster you've assembled over the last three and a half years is not what it should be. And you should be forced to face the consequences of your actions. Now, as far as the team's success for the rest of the year, it is very important that they make the playoffs. I know that there are some fans that are saying, well, what's the point of getting in if you're just going to get smoked by Winnipeg, Calgary, Nashville, Vegas, or San Jose? Well, the point is that players like McDavid and Dreisaitl are ultra competitive. And I really don't want to see their spirits crushed by another year on the outside looking in. Also, from a fan perspective, the Oilers are in danger of alienating the people who support them. Obviously, Cates and Nicholson are worried about ticket renewals, and they should be. The organization has created a generation of cynical, pessimistic adult fans, and 12 of 13 years out of the playoffs may be the breaking point for many, particularly ones that invest money in watching the team. As for actually making it into the postseason, in my opinion, and I said this in my season preview, so I haven't even really learned anything in over 40 games, it could go either way. On the positive side of things, the Oilers will get Oscar Kleffbaum back from injury after the All-Star break. This is the equivalent of making a big trade. Kleffbaum is far and away their best defenseman. Contrary to popular opinion, I actually like the Oilers' D court when it's healthy. As a matter of fact, no team in the league can boast a 10-man unit like the Oilers have. Why do we have so many freaking defensemen? But seriously, this is a pretty solid group of players. And it's important to remember that the only season in the last four years that the Oilers made the playoffs, their top 3D were healthy all year. This gives me hope. On the negative side of things, the Oilers are quite top-heavy. Now, this is not just an Oilers thing. Many teams across the league, including Boston, Calgary, and Colorado, are getting enormous production from just a handful of players. The problem is, the Oilers rely more on their top guys than any of those other teams because of the lack of forward depth and the injuries on defense. McDavid, Dreisaitl, and Nugent Hopkins are going to be fatigued down the stretch. As much as I hope they'll make it, again, I really don't know how it's going to play out. I message with a very small group of Oilers fans during most games, and the most common text I send is the shrug emoji, because it just sums up a lot of my thoughts and feelings about their outlook this year. Regardless of how things turn out, I do have some good news. I'm going to be attending the Oilers Red Wings game on Tuesday night with a buddy of mine, and we'll be in row four behind the Oilers bench. So it's probably going to be the closest I'll ever come to being able to touch Connor's luscious locks. Good night, everybody.